truthfully, uh, when I sat and thought about the theme of the STAR lectures this year, Courageous Conversations, you came to mind because that's how I see you playing a role in my life, teaching me how to have increasingly more courageous conversations. So I'm very grateful to have you give my introduction tonight. I also want to thank the staff of the Honors College and especially Dr. Becky Seip for inviting me to give the STAR lecture last spring. Um, that was a really fun email to get, and I'm honored and humbled to be chosen. I hope I won't let you down. I also really want to thank my students, past and present. I was so nervous coming in tonight, and then I saw all of you guys, and I felt totally fine. So thank you for being here. Thank you for supporting me in this way. It's really lovely. Teaching honors students here at EMU is really one of my very favorite aspects of the job. I think those of you who've had me in class, I hope you know I mean that. I really do love teaching you, and I hope tonight will be an extension of our ongoing conversations together as your students here at EMU. I also have to acknowledge that asking a professor to give a talk without PowerPoint slides, this is like asking Linus to be without his blanket or Tiny Tim to be without his crutch. Like, it's just not even fair, you guys. So um, bear with me. Uh, those of you who've had me in class know I never have lecture notes. I always just go off my PowerPoints, but tonight I have lecture notes, so forgive me. So. 20 years ago, when I myself was a student in training in Reno, our department hosted an event highlighting historical figures in psychology. And these were real bigwigs who were invited. Uh, Bandura, Ellis, like these were some of the fathers of behavior therapy. We asked prominent psychologists of their time to present the summation of their life's work. We had a whole generation of psychologists who were getting to be in their late 70s, some of them in their late 80s, and there was this sense that if we didn't capture that history, we might not ever capture it. Many of the presenters were, uh, they were sort of the fathers of the particular brand of therapy that I was learning, and yes, they were all men, and I was totally geeked out about this, right? I mean, this was fantastic. These are real luminaries in my field. And as each psychologist, as each scientist took the dais, one after the other, to describe their seminal works and major discoveries, they were commenting about their motivation to study various aspects of human psychology. They were citing previous research, talking about how their research agenda had really followed to develop the discipline and increasingly uh, sort of further the science, right? So good science, as you know from hopefully all of our classes, is designed to take the next logical steps and extend our body of knowledge. However, I vividly remember one leader in the field abruptly stopping his talk right after he very logically described his interest in developing behavioral techniques for people with serious mental illness. At the time that his career really came into being, we didn't yet have many of the modern drugs that we do now, and a lot of people with serious mental illness were, for all intents and purposes, housed in mental institutions for a lot of their lives. And his research had really been about creating more humane treatment for people when they were in asylums. So he was giving this very scientific explanation of how his work came to be, and he stopped, I'll never forget this, he hit his hand, don't worry, I won't do it, he hit his hand on the podium and he said, bullshit. Everybody was silent. You could have heard a pin drop. You don't talk that way in scientific meetings. Dr. Paul went on to say something to the effect of, that's a lie I just told. I'm saying that I wanted to do this line of research because it was the next scientific step. But the real reason that I wanted to be a clinician had nothing to do with the extant research. It had everything to do to, with the fact that my brother had schizophrenia, and there was nothing that I or my colleagues could do at that time to help him. I became a psychologist because I love my brother, and although I've never admitted that to anybody in the scientific community, that's the real reason for my research career. I can't believe I'm saying it now. I became a psychologist to try to save my brother, and that's the truth. The room was so silent it was deafening. There was this pause, and he returned to his speech the way he intended to give it. Later, I had the honor of driving Dr. Paul and his wife back to their hotel. And I'll never forget, I loaded this frail elderly couple into the back of my little two-door Saturn, and I shut the car door, and I thought, I'm not gonna mention anything. The minute the car door shut, they both just started to cry. They held each other the entire drive, 
And here I was, you know, in this car, seeing this very vulnerable, very intimate moment. Um, not by my design. I felt like I was intruding. It was such an important moment. And his wife just kept patting his hand, saying how proud she was of him for being honest. I've never forgotten that speech or that long car ride back to the hotel. I was struck by how a person of such prestige, such notoriety, could simultaneously be so afraid of telling the truth. The stigma surrounding mental health problems is profound and long-standing. In a moment in time when we're actively deconstructing stigma around so many other forms of human diversity, I'm continually taken aback by our relative callousness toward individuals and families coping with mental health problems. The research literature robustly supports this contention, and I'd like to spend some time this evening deconstructing how the stigma was built in the first place and examining how we, and especially you, as the next generation, might begin to dismantle our prejudices by harnessing the power of our hearts and minds. One of the most commonly held beliefs about people with mental health problems is that they are unpredictable, dangerous, and violent, all of which are myths to a great extent. Here's the thing. People who commit serious crimes very often have mental, untreated mental health problems. However, such a small percentage of people are dangerous that it's grossly unfair to categorize people with psychological problems as being dangerous. Let me say this another way. Among people who commit serious crimes, a high proportion have serious mental health problems. However, among people who have mental health problems, very, very few have the kind of serious mental health problems correlated with violent behavior. Remember, correlation is not the same as causation, right? Anyone who's had me, this is like the main thing you would learn. So, moreover, even among that tiny percentage of people, very few people actually commit violent acts. Despite these clear facts, we persist in fearing people who are struggling psychologically. This kind of fear is a key building block in developing stigma. When we're afraid, we create stigma to distance ourselves. Not only do we fear for our safety, but we also, as a culture, harbor another kind of fear that is the palpable fear of being socially ostracized. Study after study shows that people prefer social distance from others who they perceive to be having mental health problems. It's the exact opposite response from what would be considered helpful. We pull away precisely when we should be leaning in. I get it. When people are suffering, they're generally less pleasant to be around. Think for a minute if we acted this way when our friends or our family members are physically ill, or even worse, if people treated us this way when we're sick? Imagine if you had a terrible case of the flu and as a result, your mom stopped talking to you. No less bringing you soup and ibuprofen or giving you rides to the doctor. She'd totally lose her mom card, right? You can't behave that way. If someone is sick, you lean in, you take care. In fact, if you consider your own experience, you might even begin to believe that those very acts of kindness are part of the cure. When you're not feeling well, and people lean into you and show you gentleness, show you care, even before the medicine starts to work, you start to feel a little better. When it comes to mental health problems, affected individuals may even actively push you away socially, telling you to leave them alone or to mind your own business. However, study after study tells us that people are most likely to commit desperate acts when they're socially isolated. The very thing we're being asked to do is the wrong thing to do. Sadly, numerous studies have been conducted with children and suggest they're no more open-minded than we are as adults. While we can see what appears to be social progress when we examine children's attitudes and beliefs about other human differences, including racism and homophobia, there's some hope there in the literature. This trend doesn't apply when we ask children about mental health concerns. One study found that children would rather wet their pants in front of their class or be blind rather than have a mental health problem. Let that sit with you for a second. Kids would rather be blind than have a mental health problem. Oh my goodness, that study takes my breath away. It's so sad to me. Your generation has so much work to do, namely, we need to take the first step in reducing stigma 
is to decrease our fear around these problems. We have to not socially transmit that idea that we need to be afraid socially or that we need to be afraid for our safety. The second major step in reducing stigma, I think, is changing the way we communicate about mental health problems. So for a minute tonight, I want us to talk about how we talk about psychological problems. I have on my desk right now, as I know some of you do as well, the fifth edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the DSM-5. I know that's a mouthful. Those of you who are in abnormal better have that book. The DSM is our main reference as mental health professionals and contains therein the criterion that mental health professionals have all agreed upon in order to make diagnoses accurately. But that isn't the part of the lengthy title I want you to pay attention to. Notice the last word in the title. It's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, fifth edition. Five. As a student early in my career, I had the DSM-3. This means that in my 22-year career, there have been several new versions of the DSM. The leaders in our field, the field of psychology, have changed their minds that many times about what constitutes various mental illnesses, mostly in response to the evolving nature of scientific knowledge, but also in response to changing social norms and opinions. Literally, one of the criteria for a behavior to be considered disordered is societal disapproval. This means that what is considered normal is partially a process of peer nomination and a product of our culture at that moment in time. It wasn't that very long ago that people would be diagnosed with a mental disorder if they did not identify as straight. Isn't that amazing? As mental health professionals, we would have made that diagnosis. Of course, doing so today would be malpractice and you would be rapidly and appropriately stripped of your license. But when we have a history as a discipline of pathologizing already marginalized groups, it makes sense that in part our culture would equate diagnoses with stigma. Whenever we assign labels to people, we run the risk of marginalization. But this only happens when society decides that a label has a negative valence rather than explanatory power, which is really the intention in making a diagnosis. It's valuable from a scientific standpoint to be able to make diagnoses because diagnoses convey meaning and are a, a scientifically specific form of communication between professionals. However, while these words are neutral to professionals, diagnostic labels are not neutral to the lay public. As a culture, we have so many pejorative terms and coarse euphemisms for psychological problems. I don't want to say them, I don't want to reference them, because I don't want to give them that energy. Everybody knows the words that people use, that we, we call people when we think they're struggling psychologically. A 2007 article enumerated 250 different slang terms for mental health diagnoses. 250. Language is often an in-group, out-group phenomenon. If you consider examples such as race, racial slurs and stigmatizing language used to refer to LGBTQ people, these ways of speaking seem to be meant to create distance between majority and minority groups, a way of making the distinction between us and them. If you hold the power to use these terms as put-downs, you hold privilege, and with that comes great responsibility to not use those words in demeaning ways. Here's the thing. Some of the ways that we use terms associated with psychological health in a casual way may be just fine. I'm not trying to be the language police. For example, if we see a little kid running around and say that he or she is running amok, amok in other cultures is actually a diagnosis. In Inuit cultures, amok is a term that would be used. Or we might say that somebody's acting like a maniac. Technically, these words are very closely related to diagnoses. People use the word crazy all the time. How about Patsy Cline, right? I'm not trying to get on her case. I'm not entirely sure this is such a problem. Words like nuts and crazy are so far removed from the actual diagnoses that I'm not sure we even relate them to mental health in any meaningful way anymore. They've taken on a life of their own. Way more problematic is our propensity to use specific diagnoses in a casual manner. 
I used to have an assistant whom, whenever she would complete a detailed job well, would credit her OCD, a diagnosis which she clearly did not have. I was sitting at my son's football game earlier this week, no kidding, and another mother, herself a teacher, you can't make this up, referred to the coach as retarded. I can't tell you how much this bothered me, and I wish I could tell you I handled it better. I didn't. I despise it when people lose their keys or can't find their car on the lot and say, oh, it must be my ADHD acting up. How offensive is that to people who actually have ADHD? Let's think about this for a minute. Can you even imagine if we used common medical diagnoses that don't carry stigma in the same way? What if we saw someone walking down the street and said, look at that guy, he must be diabetic. She's doing such a sloppy job on that project, it's like she has cancer. <laughs> it's absurd, right? No one would ever speak that way. But that's absolutely what we do with mental health diagnoses. We take a medical terminology and we use that scientifically specific language and apply it very, very liberally, very, very thoughtlessly. And in doing so, it becomes highly problematic and highly stigmatizing. Why then is it okay that psychiatric diagnoses have been co-opted by, co by the lay public and are commonly used as put downs or to explain idiosyncratic behavior? By doing this, we not only deepen stigmatization, but we also dilute the meaning of the professional terms themselves. In some cases, even leading to a change in terminology. For example, and I think this is one of the more painful examples. It's hard for me to even say out loud, to be honest with you. The term mentally retarded. I, I hate to even say it. However, when my colleagues conduct a psychological evaluation, this is an accurate medical diagnosis that they are called upon to give under certain circumstances. And if they don't, that family, those parents, cannot bill for insurance because that is an appropriate medical diagnosis. It's the only term for a particular cognitive set of symptoms that is recognized as the technically specific term. However, on every document except for insurance billing, we use different language. We talk about intellectual impairment. We talk about traumatic brain injuries. Because our culture has so bastardized the term that it can't be used outside of charts or insurance documents without being cruel. We would never use that language with a family member. It's too cruel, it's too pejorative. Our culture has taken this specific term and made it into something that it never was meant to be and made it so hurtful we had to abandon the term itself. If we're to decrease stigma, we need to stop allowing ignorant use of diagnostic terms that are either inappropriate or pejorative in some way. Moreover, we don't just need to stop speaking in those ways ourselves, but we need to be ready to act as educated vigilantes and speak up anytime someone around us uses these terms in these ways. Doing so is gonna take some courage, you guys. The same way that speaking up if someone tells a racist joke takes courage. But this is a time for bravery. Okay, so so far, we've talked about dismantling the first two critical building blocks of stigma, fear and the language we use. I wanna turn our attention now to what I would contend is the third, not talking about mental health problems and why it might be the case that we either don't talk about the issues or when we do, we talk about them in a secretive way. I believe we're less likely to talk about any problem that we perceive to be hopeless about or powerless to control. When it comes to mental health problems, it's really only been in very recent times, really the past three decades. I know that doesn't seem like recent times to you, but in the field of psychology and the history of the discipline, that's recent times that we've developed both medications and talk therapies that have been found to be consistently effective in the treatment of psychological disorders. I wonder if part of what contributes to the stigma around psychological distress is the belief that nothing meaningful can be done, so why talk about it? I can still remember when I was a child hearing my grandmother whispering the diagnosis, cancer, in reference to people who we knew were sick back in the 70s. The word was literally unspeakable 
largely because it was considered a death sentence, and to say it out loud was too painful, and somehow considered disrespectful of the afflicted person to speak openly about their disease or their diagnosis of cancer. Now, 30 years later, myself and my colleagues here at EMU are doing a series of studies in collaboration with the U of M, examining how parents and doctors tell children that they have cancer. And we don't speak the word in hushed tones at all. The more information children have in more clear terms, the better they fare, the better their quality of life, the better adherent they are to their medication regimens. Speaking in a transparent way is very, very powerful for real health outcomes. Despite the fact that we have at our disposal an arsenal of treatments for psychological problems with reasonable rates of success, I find that when people speak of their mental health concerns, they're still speaking in whispers. People share their struggles off to the side in darkened corridors, eyes diverted, sometimes after class. Some clinics, I've worked at these clinics, offer separate entrances and exits so a client would never see another client in passing. God forbid someone know that you came to a mental health clinic. Sometimes, even when new clients come to my office for therapy, they're reluctant to disclose what they're experiencing. Can you imagine going to a medical doctor and refusing to open your mouth because you're afraid to show the provider what's really going on for fear you'll be judged? That'd be ridiculous. Of course you open your mouth when asked. But that's exactly what stigma does to people seeking mental health care. It's so, so important that individuals and families come out of the shadows about their experiences because they literally have nothing to be ashamed of. No more than if you went to your medical provider with a sore throat and opened your mouth to show them. Where does the shame come from? Both my experience as a clinical psychologist and the research literature tells us that people blame themselves for their problems. People will often use the argument that psychological problems are different than medical problems in that the latter are biologically based. But if you think deeply about this for even just a minute, I know you all are bright, you'll realize this is a false dichotomy. Clearly the mind-body connection is a strong one and the idea of dualism is antiquated. Moreover, we're finding more and more biological explanations for patterns of thinking and behavior as technology becomes more sophisticated. Increasingly, if anything, we know that psychological problems often have a biological basis. The manifestation is in thought, behavior, emotion, cognition. Connected to this argument is the idea that people who are struggling with psychological problems or addiction have brought it on themselves and are therefore less worthy of our empathy. I know many people who don't even tell their spouses that they're seeking treatment for fear of being judged. I know parents of people whose children are suffering who won't tell anyone in their social circle for fear that they'll be judged as parents, for fear that they'll be blamed for their child's concerns. Let's address this source of stigma head on. First of all, the ideological models are not nearly that clear. The best explanation that we have for the development of psychological problems is a biopsychosocial model, meaning that there are always multiple factors interacting in a complex way. We don't have a single model that indicates that a person creates their own psychological suffering willingly. Not a single model. Doing so would go, uh, uh, would go against evolution, for goodness sake. No one would bring on their own suffering willingly. Everyone, all of us, make choices every day that may or may not promote improved health. The top illnesses in the US today have behavioral correlates like smoking or poor diet, but we don't distance ourselves from people because they have type two diabetes or hypertension. In fact, in those cases, we're likely to lean in and try to offer extra support. Why can't we do the same for people who are suffering emotionally or psychologically? Like medical problems, it's the case with psychological problems that while it, not, while it may not be the person's fault that they have developed a problem, it's on them to actively seek a solution and solutions are available. Are available. It's our responsibility, it's your responsibility as young people to speak about mental health problems in a normal tone of voice, 
have those courageous conversations and become knowledgeable about mental health resources around you so that when people are making these attributions, you can let them know that help is available. Here's a quick pop quiz for you guys. Where are mental health resources available here on campus? Yeah. Caps, right on. Can anybody get the extra credit? Where else? I'm glad you knew caps, that's good. The Tower Inn has pizza, not necessarily psychological <laughs> care. Next to the Tower Inn, 611 West Cross. Absolutely, we also have the EMU Psychology Clinic. Did you know there's also a clinic in the department, the counseling department? Three clinics on campus. Double extra credit. How much does it cost? A fortune? You've already paid for it. <laughs> it's free, sort of, because it was part of your tuition, right? EMU CAPS is free, free psychological care from the highest levels of professionals in our field. They're outstanding psychologists. The counseling center, also free. EMU Psychology Clinic, 10 bucks flat fee. That's a 90% off sale. Pretty good deal, right? So, we've examined ways in which stigma is constructed, but we haven't really touched on why it matters so much that people who are struggling psychological, psychologically are stigmatized in the first place. To be blunt, it's a matter of life and death, and I'm only being a little bit dramatic there. We know with certainty that people who experience stigma around their psychological concerns are much less likely to seek treatment. Without treatment, to be clear, the majority of people will recover, but not without significant disability and loss to their quality of life. Moreover, when people are untreated or undertreated over time, their life expectancy decreases significantly the longer they go without appropriate care. Upwards of 20 years different in their life expectancy for people who are considered to have the most serious of diagnoses. 20 years lessened life expectancy. That's how old most of you have been on this planet right now. These statistics hold without even consideration of those who are moved to take their own lives as a result of their unremitting suffering. That controls for people who lose their lives to suicide. I don't know if the name Heinz Prechter rings any bells for people who haven't been in my class. Uh, maybe people who've been living in Southeast Michigan for any length of time would recognize that name. Prechter was a very successful businessman who founded American Sunroof Corporation in 1965. He was a close friend of the Bush family and was named Entrepreneur of the Year by the Harvard Business Club and received the Automotive Hall of Fame's Automotive Industry Leader of the Year Award. I came to know the Prechter family a little bit, maybe no is too strong, when I taught tennis lessons to their twins in the basement of their Groziel home in the 1980s. Prechter killed himself in 2001 after struggling for years with poorly managed bipolar disorder. Then Governor John Engler gave his eulogy. All the money and connections in the world couldn't break through the wall of stigma he faced. He couldn't risk jeopardizing all he had accomplished by getting the support and treatment that he clearly desperately needed. The research tells us that people who are suffering with mental health problems experience real and ongoing discrimination in housing, employment, education, and healthcare. And the longer people suffer without adequate treatment, the more profound their experience of discrimination becomes. Consider this for a moment. This auditorium is divided up into roughly three groups. For a minute, I want to invite everyone in this group and everyone in this group to make eye contact with someone in the middle group. Middle group, if you wouldn't mind, look out at the sides just for a moment. Catch someone's eye. Notice the humanity in the room just for a moment. Okay. So about a third of Americans, roughly the equivalent to our middle group, will meet diagnostic criterion for a psychological disorder 
at some point in their lifetime. Only one-third of those individuals will receive treatment for their concerns. One in three Americans will meet diagnosis, and only one in three of those people will receive care. If this was another kind of problem that wasn't laden with stigma, <laughs> if we were talking about breast cancer or Alzheimer's disease, very worthy causes, it wouldn't even be 8.30, you guys, and we would have a telethon, we'd have a phone bank, we'd have a walk set up for this Saturday where we'd be raising money, you'd have a bake sale in the lobby. We'd say, this is America. We don't stand by and let our fellow citizens suffer. Or do we? It's stigma that's standing in our way of doing the same for those who are suffering silently and invisibly. One third of us. Given the high prevalence rates of mental health problems, it's impossible for any person to be unaffected, either directly or indirectly. We cannot continue to hold on to the myth that we don't need to care about this issue, because if you or someone you love has not already been impacted, I'm here to tell you there's an extraordinarily high likelihood that you or they will be in the future. Literally, while you may try to create a false dichotomy between yourself and people who are suffering, it's just the heck, it's false. You're deluding yourself. Truly, they are us and we are them. You can't choose to not care about mental health problems because you can't choose to not care about people that you already love or will love in the future. So, given the sources of stigma and the recognition that we cannot and should not choose to ignore mental health problems, we must choose to behave differently. As a first step, we need to recognize that our fear of mental health problems and people who are suffering is irrational and inherently antithetical to our aims to create a safe and just society. I contend that we must strive to change the way we talk about mental health problems in several ways. We need to stop co-opting diagnoses and using that clinical language in flippant ways. When we hear others do so, we need to find the courage to let them know that we're uncomfortable with that ignorant and offensive way of speaking. If you wouldn't let someone use the N-word or the other F-word in front of you, and I hope you would not, then don't let them use diagnoses as a means of creating an outgroup either. We need to speak our truth about this with conviction rather than laughing nervously. Secondly, we need to take a page from the playbook of Harvey Milk, the civil and human rights activist who was one of the first openly gay elected public officials in the US and in 1977, and tragically was assassinated for his activism. In perhaps his most famous and often quoted, in, in perhaps his most famous and often quoted speech, Milk talked about the necessity of being out as a first step toward decreasing stigma and discrimination toward LGBTQ individuals. His basic contention was that we must recognize that we already know and love people within the out group in order to open our hearts. Well, I'm clearly not trying to equate coming out with regard to sexual orientation to coming out as having psychological concerns either for yourself or for people you love. I think that there's a lot to be gained from thinking about Milk's good advice to tell our truth plainly and without any shame. To borrow from that most famous speech, you must come out. Come out to your parents. I know that it is hard. Come out to your relatives. Come out to your friends, if indeed they are your friends. Come out to your neighbors, to your fellow workers, to the people who work where you eat and shop. Come out only to the people you know and who know you, not to anyone else. But once and for all, break down the myths. Destroy the lies and distortions for your sake, for their sake. I believe that in this speech, Milk was really talking about having courageous conversations. After Heinz Prechter's death, his widow, Wally, one, went very public with her husband's suffering and endowed several million dollars to the U of M for research on mood disorders. 
She's become a legitimate activist and puts her, both her time and her money toward the cause. Specifically, every year Wally sponsors a lecture series where she brings into town an author who has written about their, about their own experience of mental health problems in their family. I've taken several of you to these lectures in the past. I'm taking my current class in a few weeks. I've heard Wally speak several times at events, and when people ask her why she's so passionate, she says something to the effect of, I have children, and what I could not do for my husband, I must do for them. Progress must come from our loss. I agree with her sentiment. We must start being honest when it is safe to do so about our own suffering and the suffering of those we love. When we're trusted enough to share in the suffering of others, when they tell us what they're really feeling and thinking, when they tell us of their suffering, we need to open our hearts again and again non-judgmentally. We must practice this. We must practice listening. We need to show up in meaningful ways. When someone tells us how much they're struggling, we need to react the same ways we would in other circumstances. We need to ask, what can I do to be helpful? And we need to mean it. We need to be knowledgeable about resources and help our friends and family members get the help they need when they need it. We can't afford to wait. We need to show people that we care about them as humans, and we don't really care why they're suffering, but that they are. In doing so, we will quickly discover that indeed, we are them and they are us. And that's a courageous conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for clapping. That was very kind. I understand it's tradition for there to be questions. So if anyone would like to raise issues for conversation or questions for myself or other experts here, yes, please. The woman with, yes, please. Thank you. Me too. You're in the right place because EMU has so much expertise in autism. Um, we have so many faculty who are, are considered to be activists in the area of autism. We have research in the, researchers in the area of autism and, uh, and many clinicians who work with people with autism. So, so in your question, you were wondering, do I know people I could hook you up with to help you become an activist? Please do, for sure, yes. Fantastic. I hope, it, let's please connect. I'd love to get you connected with, with faculty who work exactly in that area. Yes, please. Uh, what made you want to go into this field? Hmm. Okay, I'll tell you the truth. <laughs> so when I was in high school, I went to high school a very, very long time ago. Um, AP credits didn't exist, right? Which I know is probably hard for you to imagine because that was probably like a real way of life for you for a moment in time. Um, as honor students, that was probably really, really important. So AP credits didn't used to exist, but like many of you probably, when I was a junior in high school, I decided I was over it, that I was sort of over high school. And so uh, what I decided to do, you could make an argument if your high school curriculum, if your knowledge base had exceeded what was offered at your high school, then you could make an argument to the school board that you should be allowed to take college courses. <laughs> This was designed for math whizzes. I was not a math whiz. I had not exceeded my high school curriculum in math. So I looked at the courses that my high school offered and there were no courses in psychology. And so I actually petitioned the school board that my high school wasn't providing for my education, this is embarrassing, in the area of psychology because it was a course that wasn't offered and it was a loophole in the rule. And so I was allowed to take college courses 
And I took psychology only because it wasn't offered in my high school. <laughs> Is that terrible? <laughs> I hope my kids don't do something like that. Uh, but the funny thing happened, right? I took psychology for all the wrong reasons, and then here I was in this course, and I was just happy not to be in my high school. I was really happy to be taking college courses where I felt much more comfortable. And this funny thing happened where I loved what I was reading, and I was reading ahead, and I was reading chapters that weren't assigned, and I was going to office hours all the time, and it just took off from there. So it, it started off a little bit um, Weasley, and it became a true passion. So uh, once I was hooked, I never looked back, and it's been truly a passion of mine um, for 28 years. Yes, please. Of course. Not take it. Right. So then I was in the kid with, like, I was in class with all the kids who really, really needed the extra time. Like, of course, I needed it too. Mm -hmm. But I have a teacher, a special ed teacher. Um, like, I was never in any of their classes. I was in all the way through my class and all that stuff. And she came out like, How can you read? Like, I'm teaching a kid who learns dyslexic and we're just using all this technology and, like, it's not really working. How did you learn to read? And I'm like, Yeah, I, I think um, what you're speaking about is tragic. And we have this real problem, this real chasm, I feel like, in America where we have somewhat of a dispute between the educational system and the healthcare system about who's going to take care of what kinds of problems. And the problem is that teachers and students are losing. <laughs> They're, uh, the products of those systems and it's not fair to your cousin, it's not fair to those students. I just want to go on record as saying like it's incredibly unfair that a teacher asked you how to teach. That's just not appropriate. It's incumbent upon us as educators to know how to do that appropriately. Um, and it speaks to the desperation of that teacher who wanted to help her students and didn't have the tools she needed. That said, I'm so glad you're here at EMU and in the Honors College, right on. That's awesome. Yes, please. I have a real sister who's cognitively antiquated disabled. And I think one of the reasons why children view mental and physical, uh, physical disability as such a bad thing is because often when a real kid wants to approach and ask why my sister's disabled, what's, why is she like that, it's always like a hush. Mm. Like parents often hush to the kids and ask them the hard questions. Like, right. 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 So they don't have to be afraid. I feel like so often when children have curiosity and we shut that down, we're teaching them to be afraid about something rather than explaining in a way that is transparent. This is very much what we found in our research with children who have cancer. Almost inevitably, when we ask them what they think is happening, it's worse than what's actually happening. And if we can provide them with real information, there's a tremendous amount of power in that. Uh, and we provide that information in a developmentally appropriate way. But I really appreciate what you're saying because I think it's important to give the right level of honest information to kids. And important to teach them to have courageous conversations in a socially appropriate and respectful way. Because really what those kids are asking is, 
what is it like to be you? They want to ask your sister, what is it like? And honestly, she deserves to be asked that question the same as anyone else. So I really appreciate what you're saying. You seem like a great ambassador and a good brother to her. Thank you. So one of the first steps in really, really anything trying to change like stigma or kind of change, make effect to society by starting with yourself and like, taking steps that you can take to people around you and affecting them. But For sure. I'm curious as to what would be that next step to make it to not only where you're educating people on the issues that need to be addressed outside of not only your community, but like communities that other people are at, and um, encouraging people to make those actions within their own communities, because a lot of things that people take step towards kind of stop, because although they're making big effect in their own community, it's not spreading. Mm -hmm. And when it needs to be able to spread and grow, and make it to where it becomes a commonplace, so that we're not ostracizing the issue. So what would be how would that go into effect? I love that question. Thank you. Um, so my thought always, and, and my perspective on this might be a little bit different as a psychologist, but I don't think so. I think the next level is policy level issues, right? So I would wonder, all of you are now voting age. Do you take into consideration when you're considering a candidate, what is their stance on mental health uh, policies? What is their stance on... Um, for example, I mean, there were, this past year, there have been a number of laws that have been passed with regard to serious mental illness. Are you investigating political candidates with regard to their position on various mental health issues? Um, when you look at your insurance policies, are you, you know, the insurance marketplace, uh, well, that's a whole other conversation, but in the insurance marketplace, do you consider mental health provisions as an important factor as to whether or not you choose a particular plan? And when you are choosing that plan through an employer, are you conveying to an employer the importance of, of quality mental health care as part of the plan that you choose? I think by demonstrating that you value mental health care and that you, through uh, who you choose to elect, that the policies and the laws around helping people and around provision of care are appropriate according to your values. To me, it seems like those are the next moves. Um, what I do as a psychologist, and I have a little bit more privilege because of that role, and I also feel like I have a lot more responsibility because of that role. So when there are things happening in the broader community, for example, uh, there are a number of communities right now that our school boards are considering plans with regard to students who are identified as having mental health problems. They are considering rules about limiting those students' freedom. I show up at those school board meetings whenever I can, and when it comes time for open call for comments, uh, I'm speaking openly and loudly about my position on those, uh, on those issues. So um, I think it's really important to think about using whatever privilege you have in the most powerful ways that you can. Um, it's interesting because Really, the introduction wouldn't have led you to believe this, but I never ever, uh, you know, outside of classroom settings, no one ever calls me Dr. Bird, but you can best believe that I show up to city council meetings and I show up to school board meetings and I stand up and say, I'm Dr. Michelle Bird, I'm a full professor and a licensed clinical psychologist in the state of Michigan. Here's my position as an expert in the field on this, this, this. I never talk that way. <laughs> um, I gather all the privilege I can in the world, and I direct it in that moment to try to have the most powerful voice that I can to affect change. And I think all of us have power that we can tap into and affect broader community level, state level, national level change. I love that you're thinking that way. <laughs> How would that affect in terms of like education uh, to the masses? that putting, like, putting your step forward, getting into these school board meetings, and bringing the question up, bringing it up to the policymakers and people that are uh, trying to make programs for the schools, do you think that would help educate the uh, public within these issues? Maybe not immediately, but as more people jump on board with the idea of putting um, down into the public and they'll start having uh, knowledge in these fields. Yes, and I think very importantly, it provides opportunities for students who have uh, learning disabilities, students who have other ways of learning. Like those are some of the major areas. Um, there was a big debate in a local community right now about students who have anxiety. 
uh, there was a, a, this huge debate for a graduation requirement in this particular district is that you take a speech course. And there was a tremendous amount of controversy around if a student has identified anxiety, what do you do with regard to the speech course? And no one who was speaking about it had any knowledge of what, it, it, like that was a little um, too truthful, but I'll tell you, nobody had any knowledge of what this meant to be making the type of policy that they were. And so I do think um, it not only creates knowledge, but it helps people who are in the role of decision maker to make decisions that are informed by science. And that's the sort of key piece for me. I feel like it's my job to serve as a liaison to translate that science to people who are in positions to make those decisions. Looks like there was a question back over here, maybe? Yes, please. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Right. Like, okay, obviously they had some sort of emotional upset, but that doesn't correlate to them being emotionally unstable or having some sort of mental condition, but it just creates such a negative stigma. Right. There's no real, like, I don't know, policy that's in effect that you kind of say, hey, you don't just say someone has X, Y, Z uh, physical illness, but right. you throw about mental illness in terms of whenever there's like a shooting situation or whenever there's a violent crime. Yes. It kind of just perpetuates that idea that in order to perform a violent crime, Right, and, and there isn't that causality, right? And, and the other piece that I wish that the media, if they're uh, addressing those issues in that way, the piece that I wish they would comment on, and, and there was actually a study that came out of EMU maybe three, four years ago, that looked at shootings on college campuses. And the most interesting finding, whenever there's a, a terrible tragic event like that, um, of course, the university community always does a careful analysis of what sort of went wrong up to that point. In all the cases up to that point that had been analyzed, they did a meta-analysis. In all of those instances, many people within the college community, within the university community, had had concerns about the shooter. Very few people in all of those instances had come forward. People backed away from the person as they had concerns about them. They got fired from jobs, their friends dropped them, their roommates moved out, all of these moves. And no one was saying, oh my goodness, we need to sound the alarm bells. We have someone who's really in trouble here. They really need our help. And so I wish the media was commenting on, this is a failure of society to offer the person the treatment they need to be well and to not be at risk of harming themselves or others. We're not talking about that. And that really concerns me. The, the failure is not in getting sick. The failure is as a society in failing to give people the treatment they need to be well and be safe, to my way of thinking. Yes. 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 And it's a, yes. Yes, so EMU does have a program. It's the um, care, care, report. care Report that the... I, I would tell you already about it and then maybe have a mentor of a care report. I don't know if students can have access. Anyone on campus can. Yes. No, no, that's perfect, thank you. So anyone on campus can fill out a care report, can request oh. a care report. And if you're uncomfortable doing that, your RA can do that for you. Um, any faculty can do that. And essentially what it means is that trained professionals from the university community will literally reach out in a caring way to that student to offer them the support and the treatment they need, to offer them the resources they need. It's not getting that person in trouble. I think there's that feeling that uh, doing a care report is somehow betraying a friendship. It's actually the act of friendship. If you had a roommate who was struggling with pneumonia and too sick to get to the doctor, you wouldn't say, ah, I'm just going to leave them. <laughs> you'd call their parents, you'd get your RA, you would call the Honors College if no one else was listening. You wouldn't stop until you got them the help they needed. If someone's struggling, struggling psychologically, don't stop until you get them the help they need. Keep telling. Keep asking. That's the loving act.
That's how we protect people. That's how we protect that person who's suffering. That's how we protect our society. That's how we protect our community, I think. Yes? I'm sorry, could you say it a little louder, please? Yes, please. Thank you for that. Very valuable. Yes, please. Do you think it increases or reduces the stigma if a mental health professional doesn't tell a patient they have a mental health disorder unless they ask? Could everybody hear that question? So she wondered, and I'll paraphrase, help me if I get it wrong, please. She wondered, does it increase or decrease stigma for a mental health professional to tell a person if they have a diagnosis? Is that accurate? So legally, any person has full rights to their record, and we are obligated to let a person know if they have a diagnosis, what that diagnosis is. So as psychologists, I can't speak for other disciplines, but as a psychologist, I'm legally bound and ethically bound that if I am giving a person a diagnosis, if I am documenting that, they have a full right to know that. So for me, it isn't really uh, the HIPAA laws, if you guys are familiar with the um, Health Insurance Portability Act, as part of the HIPAA law, people have full access to all of their records. And so I would never have anything in a record that I wasn't fully comfortable telling a client directly. So for me, it would be a legal and ethical issue and not a debate in that regard. Um, so, and my hope is that by talking about diagnoses in an honest, transparent, straightforward way, by talking about treatment options, that that gives people a ladder. Uh, when people hear their diagnoses, my intention is never to further stigma. My intention is always to reduce stigma, provide knowledge, and provide evidence-based treatment recommendations. And so that's always, the, th that's always the intention in my partnership working with someone. Any other questions or comments? These were excellent. Yes, please. In psychology? Anxiety. Anxiety is the most common. Um, those of you who've had me in class, what are the common cold and flu of psychological conditions? You know that anxiety is one. What's the other? Depression. depression. So depression and anxiety, anxiety a bit more so. I like talking about them as the common cold and flu, um, both because we think of those in ways that are truly miserable, but usually if, if left untreated, they'll go away. Does anyone ever have cold or flu and not take any medication ever or do nothing for your own comfort? Would you ever have cold or flu and not wipe your nose or use a cough drop or drink hot tea? Right? Never. You would never go on suffering without doing something to reduce your suffering. So while these are common, while they are high base rate, while you will likely recover with time, you would never ever allow your suffering to go unabated. You'll buy the extra soft puffs at least. 
right? <laughs> you'll buy cough drops, you'll drink tea, you'll eat soup. Many people, most people will take medication at that point to ameliorate the effects of cold and flu. And so I like thinking of anxiety and depression in those ways because nobody is that scared of cold and flu. Do we try and avoid them? Oh, sure, you bet, right? Absolutely, we prevent like crazy. And we should prevent like crazy anxiety and depression as well. And when they strike, we should say, oh, this is happening. I know what to do. This is going to be just fine. So anxiety is the number one. I'm so happy that some of you remembered stuff from class. Right on. Yes, please. More kids to be friends with. Right on. I want to, oops, yes, please. Sorry, okay. Like, you were comparing depression and anxiety to, like, common cold and flu, whatever. So, like, are those things curable in the same way? Like, could you officially, like, completely be rid of, like, depression and anxiety in the same way that you can, like, a cold? Like, yes. Yes. So they do, and I think that's a problem, and I think that's a myth. Um, and I don't, by the way, I don't mean to diminish the suffering of depression and anxiety. I don't mean to do that in any way. Uh, I think that human suffering is immense and profound, and I wouldn't do this work if I didn't think that. Um, so I don't want to equate them in that fashion. I'm, I'm drawing that analogy to try and offer hope. Um, when, usually when we have a cold or flu, we're talking about what, a week to 10 days if it's really bad? Um, obviously depression and anxiety are much more long-standing than that, but as a clinical psychologist, my goal is complete remission. My goal is to make myself obsolete as a clinician. When people come to me as their therapist, my goal is to eliminate the need for me as quickly as possible. It's not a great business plan, you guys, <laughs> right? But I think it's ethical and humane. That's the goal. So it is, I, I, I worry about that. I worry that people think of depression and anxiety as being lifelong conditions. They are not. They are treatable illnesses, which if treated well, hopefully occur for a finite period of time. Now the caveat I have to offer is that sometimes once people have experienced one of those disorders for a period of time, it does increase the probability that they will experience that again in the future. It probably means that they have a biological predisposition toward that particular disorder occurring. But here's the good news. If you know that you have a propensity toward anxiety, a propensity to develop depression, I know I have a propensity to develop pneumonia. You take preventive steps and try to guard as best you can, and then at the onset of symptoms, when my chest starts getting rattly, I don't wait, right? I go to the doctor right away. I know what's happening. And my hope for my clients, my hope for my family, my hope for my students is that if you have a predisposition toward one of these conditions and you notice that your symptoms are coming on, you don't wait. You get treatment right away so that things don't have to get really bad before you get the help you need. And so I feel like as long as you learn along the way, catch it quicker, treat it more effectively, that's the model. But I would never want someone to think of those conditions as being chronic, lifelong conditions without hope. If you hear nothing else today, please hear that. I truly can't thank you guys enough for your attention, for your kindness, for your excellent questions, your excellent observations, and for having this courageous conversation. Thank you so much.